just keep her through cars in a wishing well. Prayed for a love to call his own, a love to break the spell. Welcome to the Red Pill Buddhas podcast for red pilled Buddhas everywhere. Revolutionary, free thinking spiritual people who've woken up from the mainstream narrative on various levels. And I interview some of the most fascinating ones here. Please also visit thehumanunleashed.com for hundreds of hours of our video content on all areas of health, lifestyle, and much more. And the redpillrevolution.com for our five star reviewed book and subsequent publications in the Red Pill series as they come out. Hi, well, welcome back, everybody. This is my latest um, Red Pill Buddhas episode. And, uh, you know, the sort of awakening theme that I have in this uh, in this series is is beautifully fulfilled by uh, a guest I'm really honoured to have on today, Leah Keith. We actually have the real Leah Keith and not the cow who has been named after oh, yeah. Leah recently in England. <laughs> Somerset. She lives in West Somerset. I nice. Found out. Yeah. yeah. So no, I, I was so honored. These people, it's that usual story of they tried to be vegan, their health completely failed. They stumble upon some better information, including my book. So very honored to have helped these people. And they introduce animal products. Everything gets better. They're so happy. And I don't know whether they moved to a farm or where they already had this little piece of land, but that's where they're living. It's a woman and her husband and some kids. And they got their first dairy cow which is really nice because they, especially because they rescued her from one of those horrible indoor, what we would call a CAFO. I don't know what you call them in the UK, but indoor feeding, you know, they never go outside. They never eat grass. They're just fed grain, like just these terrible situations. They somehow rescued her from that. And there, there she is on their beautiful little farm on the grass doing her thing. And they named her Lier, And I was just so touched. <laughs> and she's great. so beautiful. And cows are just like little mini goddesses as far as I'm concerned. So I just that was like the best honor you could ask for is to have somebody name their cow after you. So you know, maybe, maybe we'll get that Lier on for another episode. <laughs> See what happens. But yeah, it's great to have Lier on because I mean, I'm sure everybody watching this knows who Lier is, but um, she's a great inspiration to me <laughs> in the early days of waking up from um, veganism and vegetarianism and her wonderful book, The Vegetarian Myth, and then other books following that. Yay! Oh, thank, you. <laughs> thank you. I love it. I love mine. Oh, thank you. Awesome. So I'm I've got Ben on. Oh, yeah, it's well I see. Loved. Yeah, no, yes, he's well loved. I've got I've got Ben on as well. Um, who who you know everybody knows probably is watching this is my uh, my colleague in the Red Pill and Human Unleashed, and Ben is putting together our, our latest book, The Red Pill Food Revolution, which shares an awful lot with uh, Lier's amazing uh, vegetarian myth book. And we thought we'd get into the craziness around veganism, some um, some environmental stuff, and uh, there we go. So, welcome, Leah. And what what's what's uh, what's going on now? People probably know a lot about your uh, vegetarian and vegan journey, but I was just listening to uh, some of your interviews today and reminded how eloquent you were. And so, I'd love to hear some oh, about thank that you. too. <laughs> Just great ways of describing stuff. So, well, my most recent book I wrote with two friends, Derek Johnson and Max Wilbert, and it's called Break Green Lies. Um, and it's all about how, you know, we've been offered these solutions to the problem of global warming and A, the problem with the entire framework, and B, how other, it's just a lie. I mean, I've gone from calling things a myth to calling things a lie. So you can see I'm getting older and more desperate, but we are being lied to. So that's what this book is about. This came out in the spring. So, oh gosh, it's almost a year old now. Um, feels like it was just yesterday what do you know anyway that's my latest cool no I totally letter. agree I think this is what I always say to people whether you're one of the people who believe in climate change or don't I have to admit I'm on the side of don't all the solutions are crap yeah because, they are yeah because they're not addressing the actual problem yeah go ahead I mean what, what you want what me do to just keep of, going <laughs> yeah what do you think are the main issues with this now you know because it's an important one at the moment oh, and they're, they're you guys are going to end up hating me um no <laughs> <laughs> the problem is they want it they're solving for the wrong variable um all of these solutions take industrial civilization as a given and they want the earth to conform to that and it can't be done you cannot you literally cannot consume your planet and have it too you're going to have to pick one or the other um so 
that that's the framework we're being given is that we have to find some way to perpetuate industrial civilization. And so they've come up with a bunch of solutions, which they hope would do the job. Of course, none of them do. Like literally not a single one of these things pans out when you actually look at them. Um, so number one, it's just, they're, they're, after, they're trying to solve the wrong problem. The problem is how do we stop the destruction of the planet? And the only way to do that is to stop the destruction. And the destruction is industrial civilization. So that's why it just goes around in a circle. Like they're just completely doing the wrong thing. Um, I understand why people are attached to this. It's for a lot of us, it's all we've ever known. And absolutely, we are getting some comforts and elegancies from it, especially in first world countries. We're not the ones paying the price right now. We will eventually, but most of us are basically fat and happy, right? Um, and way back in 1964, Lewis Mumford, who was a, one of the best criti cr critics of technology generally and industrial civilization in particular, he said that why we were why would we ever destroy the only planet we have? And he said, we've been offered a magnificent bribe. And that's what he called it. So yeah, we get to have all this stuff. And in exchange, we pretend not to see uh, how the entire planet will be subsumed under this. And it, and it is right now being, that is what's happening. They have actually measured the technosphere and the technosphere is in contrast to the biosphere. The technosphere is all the stuff we've made. So everything from skyscrapers to cell phones. All right, if you take the weight of all that stuff and then you take the, the weight of the biomass, the weight of all the living creatures, including bacteria down to the little tiny ones, the weight of all of that, the technosphere at this point weighs seven times more than all the living creatures on the planet. So we are covering the planet in our own technological creations. I don't know how anybody thinks life can survive this. I mean, it clearly won't. So, and it's not gonna stop till it's done. That's the thing. There's no break in the system. It's just, it just keeps accelerating. So that's what they're trying to save rather than saying, oh gosh, this is the problem. We're consuming the only planet we have. It's how do we continue to fuel that destruction? And the entire environmental movement has gotten caught up in this now where we used to be the people who were fighting for the creatures and the places that we loved. And now it's gotten it's turned into this thing where how, how do we continue to consume them? We're not fighting for them anymore. We're trying to find another fuel source to continue that consumption. And I just find this appalling. Like I don't, I don't it happened in my lifetime and it's really hard to imagine. I mean, I watched it happen in real time but I am still sitting here going, how in the world did this happen to my movement? Um, and I get that climate change feels like an emergency to people. I see it every day where I live. I mean, I don't know what you can witness where you are, but I live in a temperate rainforest and there is no rain. There has not been rain for a decade and everything is slowly dying here. And you can hear about the wildfires in California and Oregon, and it is, it's hell on earth. And even where I live on the coast, which is not, this has never been an area where fire was part of the landscape. A lot of the West, fire is part of the landscape. It's, it's a member of the community and the plants are adapted to it. You have to have fire in, for instance, for the seeds to sprout, they have to go through a fire to for like the, the pine trees and stuff. They have to go through a fire to scarify the seed coat and then you will have new growth. And so fire is like just built into the system here because it's, it's dry in most of the West. There's always been fire here, but these fires are so catastrophic that like almost nothing can survive them. Um, and we, so even where I live, which is, Right, I'm right on the coast. And so the, the redwoods is still like it's redwoods are so fascinating because they used to essentially cover the entire planet. Um, in the age of the dinosaurs, all of Europe looked like this, all you know, huge chunks of the Americas look like this. And then bit by bit, as you know, the climate slowly shifts over, you know, millions of years, this is the only area left now that has that little slice. So if you go to the old growth, it honestly, every time I go, the ferns are like eight feet tall. You're like, this is the land that time forgot. And it really is like. You can imagine a dinosaur stepping out from behind these absolutely enormous trees um, and it would look completely in, in, at, at rest there. It would look like it was home. So anyway, um, we've got this tiny little slice here. It's supposed to rain all the time. It is a temperate rainforest. You get a tiny bit, you know, for the 10 miles even, and it's a totally different ecosystem. It's a, a little bit more elevation, doesn't rain anywhere near as much, then you're really into the West. Um, but even here, I mean, we've had days now in the summers where the sky is orange, from the flames that are you know 50 miles away the ash is falling like snow it's covered everything outside and then we were told for weeks not to go out because the air quality was so horrendous 
So you have to stay inside with the window shut because if you go outside, you just have an asthma attack. And this one, it went on for weeks um, and I've never seen anything like it. It was hell. And there were entire towns that were just incinerated and people running for their lives, just, just barely ahead of the flame. So it's bad here. Um, and I've had friends that you know went to Siberia and saw the melt, uh, Northern Alaska, same story. Um, and then of course, all the, the different shifts in the ecosystem that none of the creatures that live there are prepared for. So for instance, there's the bark beetle problem in Northern Canada. Um, so normally it's so cold that there's, you know, like there's a, a hard line past which these insects cannot go. Uh, but now because it's so much warmer, they are of course infesting further forests that have no, they just have no genetic history. There's no like evolutionary history of how to fight off the bark beetles. And so all these forests are falling to these new kinds of, of predators on them that, you know, if they had evolved together, some of them would know how to fight them off, but they're utterly vulnerable because they don't, the trees don't know what to do. They don't have any way to fight them. So it's it's just like devastating huge areas of the forest there. So it's just like one example. Anyway, all of this, you know, Bill McKibben wrote a book in I think 1989, that was called The End of Nature. And that was really the first time that I think the issue of climate change was brought to the greater public. And, you know, he did a very good job making a movement about this, 350.org. And I'm not here to trash anybody and their hard work. I am saying that the entire movement got hijacked into this one concern. And the problem is, if anybody in that movement was telling the truth, I would have no problem with it, but they're not. They're not saying that industrial civilization is the problem. They're saying that industrial civilization is the thing we need to fight to sustain. So we're right back to the beginning of just, okay, well, we'll just keep consuming the planet then. And then from there, of course, you can go through these so-called solutions one by one, even taken at, on their face value, it's all just lies. Like none of these things could ever scale up to power the level of energy that people use in industrial civilizations. And all of them rest on the same industrial platform. You can't do any of this stuff without diesel fuel. You can't do it. Like you have to have oil in order to make this stuff happen. I don't know if you've ever seen the size of these mines, like a lithium mine, what it looks like. You can see them from outer space. The dump trucks are like the size of skyscrapers and they're just absolutely monstrous pieces of equipment. And that's the only way you're gonna do this rare earth mining. And then you have all the toxic byproducts from this, which are essentially permanent, except on a geological time scale. It is so utterly toxic to do this to the planet. Um, so those are just you know, like two examples, but we can go through all of it one by one. All of these solutions, in fact, just fall to pieces when you look at them. So. I know that people want to feel hope and that's one of the things they're being told is, oh great, we can just lobby for solar panels and it'll all be fine. And then we feel better because otherwise there's like this panic. There's just like this rising panic because everybody can see, you know, like bad stuff's happening to our planet. And so I get the emotional attachment to this, but it being lied to is not really, people are just going to be angry when they figure it out. I mean, I certainly was. And Again, these are not solutions that are actually gonna work. So there's like, this doesn't end anywhere well and we really need to be adults. And I love that line by James Howard Kunstler where he says that we need to be reality-based adults, that that's what our planet needs. And he's in particular talking about peak oil and the fact that everybody is in mass denial about the fact that this is coming. Um, and he's absolutely right. So I don't really wanna be soothed to sleep you know, by this sort of lullaby of lies. I want to be told the truth. And if nobody else wants that, well, fine. I will go find the truth and then I'll try to get other people to listen. Because I feel that emergency every day that, you know, our planet is just going down. And I don't know, like, are we gonna fight for those last creatures? And we've got, what do we have? We have this one planet, right? We've got one blanket of air and one cradle of soil and we have trashed them utterly. I don't know what we think we're gonna do. Like you and I cannot create oxygen, but creatures that do that for us overwhelmingly are actually plankton. I mean, we all hear about the rainforest and that's true, but two out of three animal breasts are actually made possible by the oxygen that plankton produce out there in the ocean. And you know, they're so small and so green, like nobody much cares about them, but that's it. That's what we depend on. And when the plankton go down, it's done. And right now the oceans are so acidic that there are plankton collapses happening all over the planet. 
Um, and the oceans have absorbed all this excess carbon for us. So it's a stabilizing. They're the, the oceans are trying to stabilize the climate because the planet works as an organism as a whole. So it's like, oh, wow, there's all this extra. We're going to try to absorb. But the oceans at this point are at maximum. They really can't absorb anymore. Um, and in response to this, there's all these sea creatures that are having a terrible time, including the plankton. Um, it's, it's too acidic for them now. So there's all these shell kind of shellfish creatures that can't make shells and they're all dying. But the plankton themselves are just collapsing and we're literally gonna run out of oxygen. Like, I, what are people thinking? So I, nobody wants to hear it. The mass media certainly isn't talking about it. So and the, and the, know, we're and the, out here being Cassandra. Like, it's like that woman in that, I don't know if you saw Don't Look Up, the Jennifer Lawrence character where she's like, we're all gonna die. And like, you know, she gets thrown from the movement for like screaming on television. But I was like, she's my spirit animal. <laughs> <laughs> and they're, and they're, they're blaming it all on burping cows. One sec, one sec, one sec. Okay. Go get it, go get it, go get it, whatever it is, go get it. Sorry, I have these four giant dogs and sometimes they think we're in danger anyway. There are another bear out there. There might be a bear. What's been going on this morning is somebody is mating in the in the forest. And I am not, I can't always tell the difference. We have mountain lions, we have coyotes, and we have foxes here. And they scream. And to them, they're not screaming in horror. Like they're just screaming because that's what they do when they mate. But to humans, it sounds very human. Um, so one time my neighbors called and they're like, are you all right? We heard you screaming. I'm like, that wasn't me. That was a female coyote. I promise I'm fine. But of course, whenever that starts going, all the dogs are like, what is happening out there? Especially if it's a canine creature, because they're just like, I don't know what this is. What does it mean? So all morning, the dogs have just been having a fair. I went outside and I could hear it screaming over in the that parcel there. And I was like, oh God, we're back to the coyotes or the foxes or something. And it, it might be a mountain lion. I don't know. God, I can't imagine. I mean, we we have we have enough trouble when the neighbor's cat gets on heat. And no, you just don't even know. <laughs> you just like, the sound is like, and it's eerie because it sounds like a child or or like a, uh, a woman, and you're like, but then it's not quite. So you're like, I'm not fooled by this, but that's the sound. I mean, it definitely is a little bit spine tingling. But I also really like knowing they're out there, of course. And I did my best to save as much land as I could. So I have 20 acres here. And there are mountain lions and it's a very nice little green belt. A lot of the land, it's all connected up. My neighbor has 60 acres. Um, and then because it's mostly wetland, nobody can build on it. So it's privately owned, but it goes, this little patch of this tiny little river actually goes all the way specific to the Pacific ocean. And because it's so much wetland, it, it, it's basically protected forever because it's really unbuildable. So it's this really nice little green belt back here. And Indeed, we have apex predators. I mean, besides the bears, mountain lions tells you what you need to know. Um, and they're there. There's actually quite a number of them. We had a little, uh, like a little camera, a little like a, a game cam out there. And, oh, we got picture after picture of them. And there, at one point there was a little group of them all standing there. And I see their, their footprints. I've never seen one for real though. And I'm kind of mad. All kinds of people who have visited me have seen them just standing in the driveway. I'm like, why can't I see the mountain lion? Like I'm the one that bought this land to protect it. Why do you not show yourselves? What have I ever done to you? Anyway, I know they're there and they may be stalking me at night, who knows? But um, no, it just makes me really happy knowing they're out there. Like, all right, well, if you're here in 10 years, you might be here in 20 years. And if you're here in 20 years, you might be here in a hundred years. So Nice. Go for it, little predators. Eat whatever you want. I don't care. So that's cool. So, yeah, you know, yeah. what what do you think about um, what's going on at the moment? I mean, ages ago when I read your book, it it was the first time that it it, it sort of opened my eyes to the agripocalypse, and I thought this was yeah fascinating as the as the civilizations collapse, as the soil collapses, and nowadays we seem to be pushing more and more into that direction, and uh, all the problems are caused by farting and burping cows. Now, it's what's going on here? Is this is this purposeful genocide to get rid of us by Bill Gates buying up all the farm <laughs> lands? What's going on? What do you reckon? Um, I think part of the problem is that the people who care most about the planet have been given completely wrong information for 50 decades now, 50 de five decades now, pretty much my whole life. They, they've been headed and they've just been given the wrong information. So they've been led astray. And I don't think they mean bad like they I will speak for myself that as a vegan I thought I was saving everything 
I did it for 20 years for those of you who don't know like I was completely hardcore so that is a health. record I'm amazed just to hear wrecked <laughs> my health yeah no it's very bad <laughs> you don't do it for 20 years without permanent damage there's something there's no way back from some things um but that's why I wrote a book it's like well I have my survivor mission now um but you know I believed all of it and I was 16 when I got into it and I had no idea that I was being fed lies because they didn't seem like lies they seemed like they could be true. And also, once you see those pictures of the factory farmed animals, it's horrible. And all of that is certainly true. And I, I'm sure everybody listening, we can all at least agree on that, that we shouldn't be torturing sentient beings. Uh, it's no good on any level, like we know that. So like, we can just put that aside. We all agree it needs to stop. Great, no factory farming, okay. Um, but the real problem is agriculture. And me growing up in this sort of suburban urban environment, I mean, I was lucky I saw a tree. I had no idea where my food came from and I didn't know what the cost of it was. So you end up as somebody in an urban environment, you make this decision. When I'm looking at my plate, what do I see? Is there a dead animal on it? Okay, well, that's the bad food. Um, oh, look, no dead animals. That must be the good food. And that's the end of the discussion. And that's where a lot of people who are vegan stay. They stay right there. Now me being such you know, a fanatic, uh, I was like, no, I'm doing this all the way. I'm going to grow my own food because that's the best thing you can do. And I found out really quickly that you cannot do that as a vegan. And then I was really in a quandary. So I spent 20 years back and forth, like trying to absorb alternate information about the nature of agriculture and then putting it aside because of the cognitive dissonance. And this is so classic for people who are stuck in, you know, a fundamentalist church or an out and out cult where you cannot look at the truth. You know, reality was right there as just this wall that I kept hitting and I couldn't do it because then how was I going to be vegan? So I kept putting it aside. And the beautiful part about snapping out of the veganism was that finally I can actually read all these books and know what I know because I know that I cannot raise my own food without destroying a whole bunch of living creatures. So this is the problem with agriculture. It is exactly the opposite of what life on earth does, which means it's a war against the living world. Because what nature does is perennial polycultures with an animal cohort. And every single one of those creatures plays a role in keeping life moving, keeping life still living, keeping life happening more and more, making it more dense and more resilient. And I'm gonna use my favorite example, which is grasslands and ruminants. So what is happening on a grassland? Well, the reason it's not a forest is because it's dry. So there's not a lot of water. Trees can't survive there. They need more water. So what you have is this whole different class of plants uh, called grasses. And what they do is they put down this really tremendous root system. Most of what happens on a prairie, on a grassland happens underneath the surface of the soil. And that's because it is way too hot in the summer and really cold in the winter. So they stay alive underground. So most of the biological activity is happening there. Um, and if you, you can see pictures of this online, either drawings or actual photographs where people have made these really wonderful sort of demonstration images where you can see that the roots get out you know, 12 feet into the soil. Um, trees just don't do that, they don't need to, but that's what grasses do. I mean, nature loves anybody who can fill a niche and that's what grasses did many millions of years ago. So they can survive and dry be, by doing this. Um, but as with any ecosystem, the more of you there are basically the better because everybody plays a slightly different role and communities are really what survive as a whole. It's not individuals. So on a grassland, a, a square meter of a grassland should have 25 different plants. That's a lot of plants. Okay. So that's what I mean by perennial polyculture. The polyculture part means a lot. The perennial means they live a long time. So the reason that's important is because they have time so they can build those deep roots. Nobody could do that in a year. It takes a long time. Or think about a tree, right? And nobody could get that big in a year. It's going to take many, many years for a tree to, to reach mature height. Like where I live, the old growth forest is 2000 years old. So that's how long it takes to become a mature redwood tree, 2000 years. These trees are older than Christianity. I mean, it's pretty amazing. Um, and there's other trees that are old around the planet too. I mean, there's amazing trees um, and they do that and they make these amazing communities. Um, but anyway, back to grasslands. So the way that grasslands survive is they have 
these partners in living in a dry area and they're called ruminants mostly. I know Australia is a little bit different, but you know, we'll go with North America, Europe. Um, so what is it that ruminants do? Well, they have this four chambered stomach called a rumen and it's a, a very neutral environment. So we have very acid stomachs. Theirs are neutral. And the reason is because they're basically a walking vat of bacteria. So it has to be neutral for the bacteria to survive. Like you and I, there's no way that bacteria would survive in there. And the only ones that can are the ones that create ulcers essentially. So not something you want, um, but cows and, and bison and whoever, they do this on purpose. They have this very neutral environment and they make a home for the bacteria. And the reason they're doing that is because the bacteria can't survive in that very dry, hot, no moisture environment across that long summer. So all of these creatures together sort of made this pact of, okay, the cow says, I will carry you around inside my, my lovely rumen. And then the grass is like, cool, you can eat me um, and you'll keep me alive. Because of course, what happens when the bison or the cow is done eating is it all goes out the back end and you have fertilizer and you have moisture. And the, even the urine has lots of nitrogen in it. So it's really good for the grasses. That's exactly what they wanna eat. Also true, um, grasses are really interesting in that the growth point is at the bottom of the plant. It's not at the top of the plant. So like when I look outside, I can see every tree, the tip of each branch is a different color than the rest of the tree. And that's what's been growing in for the last year. That's the new growth. It's all from the top out. But grasses are totally different. It's, it starts at the bottom. And that's because they expect to be grazed. They evolved with these, you know, rumen creatures that were going to graze them. So they did this together as a community. And when they are grazed, what happens is it actually stimulates growth. It's a very positive experience for the grasses as long as they aren't being overgrazed. Um, they actually put down more roots. And there's actually saliva in. There's actually um, enzymes in the saliva of bison and and cows that helps grass grow. It stimulates growth. So while being eaten, they're being told, oh yes, grow more, here's some help. I'm gonna give you some enzymes. So again, like it's, it's all about this community that survives together. Um, and, and so the, the, um, the, the quicker the grass is growing, the more um, carbon-based sugars that they pump out through their, their roots to feed the yeah. mycorrhizal fungi, which is another symbiotic relationship. Exactly, exactly yeah. that, yes. So you see there's another- the grass grow until it's mature, it just stops growing because it grows yep. in this sort of S-shaped curve, right? Yep, um, the S this famous S curve. Yes, it keeps yeah. sucking down carbon. So we, you know, I, I'm I don't know whether CO two is a pollutant or whether CO two is is the root of the problem. But one thing I do know is that whether the problem is CO two or whether it's a bunch of other different things, the solutions are very often the same because the solutions nature's had this nailed for a long, long time. You know, le left to its own devices, nature nature just goes done. Right. And so the thing about cows or bison is that they're not actually eating the grass. And this is the fascinating thing. They're actually feeding that grass to the bacteria. And then they're eating the bacteria. So they're trading in the most nutrient poor food on the planet, which is just cellulose. I mean, that's all grass is, is cellulose. Um, and then... The bacteria digest it and so make more of themselves and then the cow eats the bacteria so they're actually getting a high protein high fat diet by first converting it through the bacteria in exactly the way that you and i eat cows we feed them grass <laughs> we convert that grass to high fat high protein we eat the cow the cow's doing exactly the same thing with the bacteria so the bacteria don't produce short chain fatty acids or, or volatile fatty acids the, the that the cow then absorbs, is it actually the, de the dead bacteria that the cow is actually um, digesting itself? Well, I think you're right, it's more the byproducts, but yeah, it's the, the bacteria feeds the cow. Um, they're not actually eating the grass is really mm -hmm. the part that I find so interesting. They're actually like in this symbiotic relationship where they're being fed by feeding this other creature. And it just, like, we don't think about it that way, but that's what's happening. It's and it's happening so that grasslands can stay alive because somebody needs to keep circulating those nutrients and those are the creatures that can do it. 
So you can't have a grassland without these ruminants. You can't have the ruminants without the grasses. They all need the bacteria. And like you said, the mycorrhiza, of course, play an incredibly important role in all of this to keep the whole system alive underground, um, communicating and transferring nutrients and all those things that they do. So it's a community. Um, and all of this is, well, another thing about the roots too, before I get into annuals, because the, because the roots are so deep, it means that the water can actually, when it rains, the water has some way to enter the soil. And I think we can all picture, you know, a bare bit of dirt near a parking lot in town somewhere. When it rains, it just makes a puddle, right? It just pools on the surface. It has no way to enter the soil. So every time it rains, it's actually destroying that little bare spot even more because the rain just hammers down on it, like just concusses it until it's dead. Um, and then if there's a little bit of a slope, it runs off, right? And so if there's any nearby waterways, of course, all of that silt goes into the nearby river or creek um, and of course will kill it because fish can't survive that. So it like on every level, like bare ground is an absolute disaster for the planet. So the roots, yes, that's what makes that possible is that literally makes the channels for the water to enter. And the other thing that roots do that none of us can do um, they can actually reach down to the rock and they break it up. Now the plants aren't doing that alone. They do that, like you said, in concert with bacteria, they feed sugar to the bacteria. The bacteria then produces this acid that breaks down the, the rock bit by bit. And then those minerals are drawn back up. And those minerals are made avail available to the entire community of life on the surface of the soil. I mean, you and I are not gonna eat rocks for breakfast. We can't do it. And that's true for basically everybody except bacteria. We just don't have the capacity to eat rocks, but they're doing that for us to get us those minerals. Um, so these grasses are absolutely essential, right? You can see they do these incredible things. They got the minerals, they got that. And then ultimately, of course, they make a matrix that holds soil in place. Um, and every time there's another cycle of this and another season, they're just making more soil because that's what soil is, is dead plants and dead animals acted upon by bacteria to make more soil. And we owe our entire existence to six inches of soil and the fact that it rains. And that's it. That's why we have land life. Ocean life has got a different thing going on, but for land life, all of us need that. Without it, we are dead. And that's what grasses do so beautifully. They make more soil. So when the Europeans first got to North America, to that prairie, some of that prairie dirt was 10, 12 feet deep. And now it's 150 years later, it can only be measured in inches. How did we destroy that? I mean, why is a whole nother question, but how? Well, it's really simple. It's called agriculture. So instead of having a perennial polyculture with this animal cohort that make these beautiful communities, you clear all the life off that land. Every last creature is removed. And I mean, down to the bacteria. And then what happens? You plant it just for humans. So you grow one crop, you grow corn or wheat or soy, and every last one of those creatures has nowhere else to go. And that's a long-winded way of saying mass extinction. And that's what agriculture is. It's biotic cleansing. Now, how I thought this was kind to animals, I don't know, except to say I was utterly ignorant of this entire process. All I knew was those two plates. Oh, one has a dead animal, one doesn't. This must be the good one. Never mind, entire bioregions had been utterly destroyed in the service of this food. Um, it seemed like the good food. And that's, this is where they've all been led astray because they don't understand the nature of the problem. So this is like my goal here is to get people to understand that's all I want, just understand the nature of the problem because the solutions actually become quite obvious. So anyway, that's what agriculture is. Uh, some of us have been doing that for 10,000 years, more and more as time goes on, because the problem is when you do this, you're destroying your land base. So up until that point in human history, humans lived like every other creature. We lived inside biotic communities. We took our nourishment from inside living communities. So we would hunt or we would gather. Um, we didn't destroy the land around us. We didn't chop down the forest. We didn't plow up the prairie. We didn't drain the wetlands. We had no need to do that. Why would you do something so crazy? That's where your food is. Why would you destroy it? Um, and as I'm sure you both know, we had basically perfect health. Um, yeah, I mean, we were gorgeous. All of us <laughs> had perfect teeth. All of these diseases were completely unknown. All the auto autoimmune diseases, the chronic diseases, heart conditions, diabetes, cancer, 
none of that is seen in hunter gatherers. It is only seen in agricultural peoples. And oh, but but, great, but yeah, yeah, we all died at thirty-five, and it was all because of the meat. <laughs> yeah, I mean, people <laughs> believe that, right? The problem is, yeah, they have high rates of infant mortality. That's a true exactly. thing. Exactly. Um, and you know, I'm sure that's hard, but. Yeah, if if once you get the, to the age of five and you're done that sort of scary childhood period, we really haven't added maybe a year or two is all we've added to the longevity of people. And honestly, I think most of us would rather live two years shorter and be vigorous and healthy and keep our brains and not have dementia and no arthritis and our teeth, maybe die a year or two sooner um, than what we have now, which is people for decades in increasing debility stability and humiliating circumstances and no dignity left. And I mean, we've all seen it in our families, what happens as yeah. people have strokes. So and as we're not living longer, we're dying well, longer in this, in this culture. Well, that's a wonderful way to put it. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, yeah, we're keeping people alive, but for what purpose? I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's horrible to, to watch and it's horrible to consider. It's like, none of us want that existence mm -hmm. at the end. You know, those long, long years of just, uh, having no independence and increasing pain and less and less cognitive function and all of that. And none of that is necessary. We actually should be pretty sharp into old age. Um, you know, there's a reason that a lot of, of traditional people have, you know, the sort of the class of the elders and it, they're the smart people. <laughs> they're the ones who carry the culture and know the stories and the songs and the rituals and uh, can explain why we do it this way. Um, and, and if their memories were gone, they wouldn't be able to do all that. Like there's, I know there's a, in one of the Mohawk tribes, there's a, a, a Thanksgiving ceremony um, that they do every once in a while. It takes four days to do this. And it's literally, they're naming every single creature that they know exists and saying, thank you. And you have to memorize four days worth of just this one prayer. And there are people alive who can still do that. And I cannot imagine having that kind of a memory. Um, and they do. And this is, you know, if you live a traditional life, you know, with all that high fat, wonderful food, you're going to have a brain that can do that. So anyway, that's what agriculture destroys is all of it. Um, and then the water can't get in. And then, you know, all the local waterways are destroyed. And of course, there's no trees left because you've chopped them all down. Um, and the soil is destroyed. And that's the one of the biggest problems with agriculture is that you, you blow through your soil often very quickly. There were farms in places like South Dakota on the first day of the Dust Bowl, they lost all of their soil in one day from the wind because there were no roots because they had plowed up the prairie and there was nothing there to hold it in place. And you can go on Google and look at these photographs where it's just like this cloud of dust covering entire towns. And it's like absolutely horrifying. I mean, people just died from not being able to breathe. And that's what happens from agriculture. This is inevitable. I'm not, this is not agriculture on a good day. It's literally what it is. The dust storms were so bad. They, were, they carried topsoil all the way you know, into the Atlantic Ocean. There were ships out at sea that were also covered in dirt, like halfway across the continent, you know, halfway across the Atlantic Ocean. That's how far it went. And you can see the same thing now. There are dust storms in China that are so bad. The dust, you can watch the clouds on satellites moving across the Pacific Ocean into the United States. Eventually they hit the Rocky Mountains in Colorado and that all that dust comes down and it literally creates asthma in children in Denver, Colorado. That's topsoil from China. So nothing has gotten any better here. We've skinned the planet alive. Yeah. So by the year 1950, uh, we were essentially out of topsoil because this had been going on for 10,000 years. Every single piece of land that could have been taken by agriculturalists was. And let's be very clear, farming spreads by genocide and by, um, by militarism. It spreads by war. Nobody willingly undertakes this activity. Um, the well, that's soldiers, why the Roman Empire kept expanding as quickly as it did, because they screwed up their, their own topsoil. The Romans well, used to yes. grow most of their crops in northern Africa, which is now yes. the Sahara Desert. Yep, the there it is. The fertile present where the agricultural revolution is understood to have developed is now Syria, Iraq you know, Palestine, Egypt. Nobody in their right mind would call that place the Fertile Crescent now, nobody. We've all seen those pictures. I've never been there, but yeah, it's just a moonscape, right? It's just desert and rock. And I was once shown a photograph of um, a man who was doing research about exactly this topic. And there's him, and then there's all the people who 
uh, you know, he was staying with and doing research with and whatnot. Like, so his, his cohort over there um, was in Iran, I think. But anyway, um, he's like, look at the difference. And this guy was like 6'2", six, 6'4", six, you know, sturdy American type person raised on beef. And then everybody from that region, they're literally a foot shorter than him. I mean, they're just absolutely tiny. He's like, this is what you get, ever shrinking topsoil, ever shrinking minerals, and this poverty diet where there's not enough animal fats and the, there's no way to absorb the minerals they are getting. And they're, you know, a foot shorter than they should be. They could achieve their, you know, ecological, whatever, you know, their, um, it, their um, it just sort of genetic potential. If they could eat proper human nutrition, again, the next generation would be taller. And then probably by that next generation, they'd be reaching a more appropriate height for humans. But, you know, yeah. as it's going, it's nothing but flatbread is all they're eating. And it's just, yeah, you're going to be five feet tall. Yeah. So, so, so you, you've brought us up to like the 1950s. So the mm-hmm. topsoil's screwed. Go and then they, they, then they started to cheat by repurposing the ammunition factories to make nitrogen-based fertilizer. But still, so they're, they're forcing plants to grow by force feeding them nitrogen, which is yep. unnatural nitrogen. But still, whenever there are plants in the in, in the ground, these are still annuals, right? So how how, yes. how deep is there? You know, they're only in for a few months of the year, yeah. and their roots are down a few inches as well, right? Yeah, I mean, they just can't. They don't have time. This is the thing about perennials. They have years and years to figure it out and to make really beautiful deep roots, and you know, for trees, really big bodies. But annuals can't do that. They are only going to live, you know, spring, summer. They're dead in the fall. That's it. So they don't have a lot of time. Um, the one thing they're gonna put all their resources to is the future generation. It's true for all of us, that's what counts. Whether we have babies or not, that's what we're made for. So everything goes to that seed head. That is how annuals survive is those seeds. Um, and so you have to picture, so we're in nature, everything's good, right? We've got a perennial polyculture covering everything, but there might be a disaster. There's gonna be a fire, a flood, an earthquake. And some piece of that land is going to be bare, you know, it's going to be bare, it's going to be cleared for those reasons. This happens, it's a thing. It's, you know, things flood, things, there's fires. Um, But it's a biological emergency for the planet to have bare ground. And this is the moment that the annuals are waiting for. This is their specific niche in nature. Um, They have these giant seeds. Now the seeds cannot compete against the roots of the perennials. So as long as the ground is covered, you're never gonna see these annuals. But every once in a while, there's gonna be this emergency and that's their moment and they spring to life. So for the first few years, you would just see annuals in those places. Um, And I've seen it on my own land because some of this was fairly destroyed when I got here. And you know, by building it back, you can see now exactly this phenomenon. The annuals are like a Band-Aid. So let's say you cut your hand, and you're bleeding, so that's your little emergency, you would put a Band-Aid on it or a bandage even bigger, and you would hold that skin together. And that's what the annuals do, they hold it together. Eventually you don't need that Band-Aid, why? Because your skin knits back together and seals up that wound that, again. That is, no exactly, longer the yeah, yeah. that is exactly how we talk about it, that anywhere you look in nature, anytime you see bare dirt, that's a problem area. By definition, there's nothing growing there, yep. right? Yeah. So you uh, had these quote pioneer species. Go. Yeah. So yeah. in you know, like grasslands, woodlands, forests, there's always a blanket, a skin of um, decomposing organic matter that protects mm-hmm. the soil. But it's all part yeah. of the, the same whole thing. And ag- farmers come along and think, it's what a great idea. Let's drag a plow through the soil. Let's slice up all the living stuff that's in it. And we get this temporary short term boost of nitrogen. And we look, we're making it more fertile you know, or let's throw, what do you think is a ridiculous term, fertilizer? Because you're not making the, the ground any more fertile no. by chucking this stuff on it. You're actually making it less. It's, it's Yeah, the, the, this has been shown over and over again that those chemical fertilizers just, just wreak absolute havoc on any life that is in the soil. It will temporarily boost the growth of those particular plants, but there's nothing left in the soil. It's just chemically sterilizing the soil. So, I mean, whatever the opposite word is to fertilize, they're sterilizers, I guess, would, would be a better word. You have chemical sterilizers in there. Um, but yeah, so annuals can't do any of that. They can't hold the soil in place, particularly not the way that perennials can. They can cover it temporarily, keep it safe, but they can't build the deep roots that actually provide that matrix. They're not going to hook into um, that mycorrhizal network. They're just not deep enough to do much with that. Um, They certainly can't build it. They're not there long enough. 
And uh, yeah, they don't provide those, the channels for the, for the rain to enter, but they do provide some cheap carbohydrate for some humans and they are very addictive, which is probably the reason we got into this. Nobody really knows why we started doing agriculture because nothing we were told in school is actually true. For instance, I was told, as most people were told, um, oh no, humans led this terrible existence. They were hungry, they were cold, things were wretched and awful. And then huh, agriculture, we figured it out, how to grow food and store it. And then we were safe and warm and happy and we always knew where our food was. And that's a lovely story, none of it's true. Nothing in the archeological record shows that. It shows very, very healthy humans might've been periodic moments of hunger, like in February when the game was sort of scarce. And you see that in like the bows lines and the teeth or in, in actual bones, but it's just, it stops immediately and then growth continues. So it's like, all right, periodic hunger once in a while, we get it, the whole, nobody had enough food for a few weeks. Um, with agriculture, it's just constant nutritional deprivation to the point where they have holes in their skulls. The two-year-olds are losing their teeth. Um, it could not be clearer. And anyone who's a, an, either an archeologist or a medical anthropologist can look at a bone and tell you instantly, was this a hunter gatherer or was it a farmer? Because the hunter gatherers have these beautiful, long, strong, disease-free bones and the agriculturalists are small and brittle and look like shit, frankly. It's very, very obvious. So you don't see starvation until farming. And now all of a sudden you see every kind of nutritional deprivation in the bones and also, autoimmune diseases. How do we know this? Well, as wheat spreads across Europe, what follows right behind it in the archeological record? Rheumatoid arthritis, which you cannot mistake for anything else in the, in the record. So there it is following with the, the farmer soldiers right out of the Near East, boom, right across Europe, rheumatoid begins. Um, it's wheat, it's the gluten, we know this. So anyway, yes, uh, it's a war against the world. That's the problem. And this is what we've done on every single continent except Antarctica. Um, yeah, it's all gone. Every single inch that could be taken by humans has been taken, which means 98% of the old growth forests and 99% of the world's prairies have been destroyed, harmed in some way or out and out destroyed. Um, and I don't know how you can take something, an activity that has destroyed 98% of habitat for animals and call that good for animals. It's not, but I didn't know that when I was 16. They tell us agriculture is the solution for famine it's completely the wrong way around exactly. agriculture it yeah. creates famine so I, i've got a question i'm bursting to ask you coming all the way back around <clears throat> that you mentioned your mountain lions earlier on and the fact that they are apex predators that's mm -hmm. one thing we haven't mentioned so far in this glorious food web you know mm -hmm. people like they tell you at school, the food, the food pyramid or, or you know, the food chain is this like pyramid structure with apex predators at the top. But I like to think of it, or we talk in our book, we talk about it. it it's, it's a web, it's a chain. It's a great yeah. mass ball of relationships that link. And yeah. every animal, every living thing's place in that glorious, rich, abundant web of food, um, a web of life is defined by what it eats and what it's what what it's trying to avoid being eaten by or what it what it wants to be eaten by in some cases like we said with the grasses or fruits and stuff like that but how important are predators in all of this i'd love to get your your view on it particularly in the context of the the animal rights and vegan argument yeah so some of those animal rights arguments are insane and i don't mean that as an insult i honestly mean that in terms of just being out of touch with how our physical reality works because yeah, there was that. Yeah. just yeah. just before you go ahead with that one i must i must just say one one other thing when you said insane i remember seeing a conversation uh, between vegans where they were going on about how they should split the african continent and put yes. the herbivores on one side yes and the predators on the other on the other eventually they'll learn to eat plants eat grass Insane. Yeah. Sorry. Insane. No, they've had um, in the New York Times, which is supposed to be the paper of record. They uh, they had a, an, an op-ed published exactly arguing for that. So then, you know, they get mad at me. They're like, oh, we never say that. Yes, you do say that. Some of you absolutely say this. I have seen this argument over and over again. And there it is in the New York Times. So don't pretend that some of you aren't this crazy. Um, yeah. So they think that all predation is wrong. And they somehow are gonna separate the predators from not. And I hate to tell them, but ruminants are also predators. First of all, 
cows have been seen eating things like mice and birds. So they will eat them when they need them. But even beyond that, the normal diet of a ruminant is about 10% insects. And insects are animals, hate to tell you people, they are animals, just like me and you, animals. They don't have central nervous systems, but they absolutely have nervous systems, if that's your dividing line. But they're animals, they're a kind of animal. Um, so 10% is animals. And this is one reason why grass-fed ruminants are so much healthier for themselves and also for us to eat is because of that 10%, it's absolutely crucial. When you remove that from their diets, they're nowhere near as healthy. They need those compounds just like you and I do. So, and they just naturally get that when they're eating grass. And the same is true for creatures like orangutans that, I mean, they just eat leaves all day long, but it's gonna be the same figure that there's, you know, maybe 10% is there's insects on those leaves. So they're not vegetarian. I know they're held up as like, oh, the perfect vegan animal. They only eat leaves. Yeah, and 10% insects. Um, anyway, yeah, but we've seen, and deer as well have been photographed eating things like birds and squirrels and whatnot. So they hunt, I hate to tell you. So how are you even going to separate who's a predator and who's not, first of all? But second of all, all right, fine. You just want to take out, you, you mentioned the apex predators. Yeah, there's this thing called the trophic pyramid and that's how energy um, goes up. Um, so you've got, you know, the grasses are the primary producers. They actually take sunlight and turn it into their bodies. We can't do that. I mean, I wish I could just go outside eat sunlight and be done, <laughs> it would be really cheap. Um, but we can't do that. We don't photosynthesize. But anyway, a lot of creatures do, and that's great. We got trees, we got plants, we got plankton, the phytoplankton, um, you know, that's wonderful. We wouldn't be here without them. Uh, they do that. And then the next layer is the animals that eat that. So the energy is condensing up another level and then you have predators like us. And so it's condensing even further. Um, but that's just for energy. Like the trophic period doesn't mean anything else. It's, it doesn't mean anything about oh, who's better or who's on top. Like, there's not really a top in nature, you know, like you said, it's just a cycle and we're all waiting our turn to get eaten. Um, anyway, predators play an absolutely crucial role. Uh, we can talk about how, how herbivores should be behaving out there. And without predators, they don't behave well, which is to say like a cow will just stand and eat at the same spot until there's nothing left. Uh, same with bison. Um, they don't actually know on their own how to behave to keep the grassland completely healthy. The creatures that do that for them are predators because what predators is the pulse. It's like the, they provide the heartbeat and they do that by coming up against that herd and creating fear, which, you know, is not a nice moment, but it's a part of life. And when they feel the fear, the, what the ruminants do is they bunch up into this tight group and then they move on very quickly. So that is the action that really makes grasslands grow better, faster, stronger, deeper is tightly bunched moving quickly. And this is what people like Alan Savory teach livestock farmers what to do is essentially by observing that in nature and saying, oh, that's the part we're missing. Just letting them wander freely across a range, you end up with degradation. And, and that's why it's not because the animals themselves shouldn't be there. The land absolutely needs them. The problem is they're not behaving well because they're missing part of their community. They're missing the predator cohort. And this is how none of us are who we should be without the rest of our neighbors. They, yeah. they don't know how to do it on their own. But if you add a wolf or a bear or a human or a mountain lion, all of a sudden they behave completely differently. And indeed the, the land comes back to life. And I'd like to talk about Yellowstone, but I think you have a question. Yeah, uh, are you familiar with um, the story that there was a nature reserve in the Netherlands called Oostwadersplassen? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know about that one? Where some-, yeah. some I um, mentioned them in here. They're oh, in here. Fantastic. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. We don't need to say that then. But no, but your audience, you should tell, tell them what you want to tell them about it. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we mentioned it in our book as well and, and other places. But yeah, so basically it's this, this quite kind of medium-sized nature reserve where somebody decided I want to put some, some uh, like rare breed cattle and Polish horses and, and all these herbivores went, go, go into this thing um, so they can live in peace and harmony. And basically what happens is every year the vegetation all grows well, the herds expand, they eat all the vegetation, there's no more vegetation, and then they all die off. Right. And the smell from the rotting carcasses drifts across the nearby towns and people complain that there's a smell of rotting meat everywhere. But the reason for that is because they are allowed to expand too rapidly, I'm guessing to, you know, because of the available food and they're not being predated. And then, 
eventually people had to start going in with guns and culling the herds with guns. Yeah, and eat them, people. It's perfectly good food. Like that's what our role is, to, to cull the herd, to thin the herd. And again, tightly bunched, quickly moving. That's our role. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And you can't just put them out there on grass and expect it's going to go well. It's They're just going to keep, they don't have birth control. Like they don't understand that they have to stop having babies. That's not a thing that exists in nature. So yeah, they're going to have babies every year. The, the, the herd is meant to, when they've got an abundance of food, they're supposed to reproduce and expand right. and grow the herd. And then, you know, the wolf pack would then correspondingly get stronger Bigger. and then, yeah. you know, you know, and, and, but and there's more for them to eat. And this is the beauty of it. And this is like, uh, we, we say in um, the red pill food revolution, in, in ancestral times, you would, you'd, you'd be insane to say, okay, guys, let's go out, let's kill three mammoth today, right? Because <laughs> wouldn't that be great? We'll have all that meat. And then all the other hunters will go, you're nuts, right? We kill three, there's 50 of us, right? right. It takes us a month to eat one mammoth, right? And process all that. You kill three, we're gonna eat one mammoth, we're gonna have two rotting mammoths, and there's gonna be yeah. fewer mammoths. You know, so yeah. historically, in this kind of natural balance, if you over harvest anything, you you end up getting less of it. But in the in agricultural society, and you've you, you've talked about this before, in the agricultural society, it's you're actually incentivized to mine the soil as quick yeah. as you can and to gather yeah. as much to yourself as you can, which is completely, I would say, against nature's laws and nature's philosophy. There, and, and people knew what that balance was. They knew the exact number of human young to productive adults you could have for your region, for your bioregion, for your territory. Um, and I'm not saying this was necessarily a happy thing, but people knew how to space their children um, to the point where, you know, it's, I mean, I've read these stories about the Inuit who live you know, way up north above the Arctic Circle and it's a very harsh environment. But if a woman's husband died, she was expected to kill any children she had under the age of three because there certainly, there just weren't gonna be enough adults to keep everybody fed. It meant everybody was gonna be hungry for the next generation. Um, there's an exact balance between productive adults and dependent either elders or children. And again, I am not saying that would have been a fun moment for anybody, um, but it's either that or everybody is gonna starve. So they knew what the limits were. And most traditional people are pretty good about spacing their children out anyway. They know that you shouldn't have them more than every four or five years apart. And we know the role that breastfeeding plays in, you know, at least a little bit of natural birth control and all the various, you know, taboos against having sex when you're breastfeeding and all this, and it helps keep the population where it should be because the, the other option is everybody goes hungry. You couldn't just go to the store and buy more food as if that doesn't come from somewhere anyway. But I mean, at this point, we're just on borrowed time. Um, but, you know, so anyway, they, most people who have lived in place for thousands of years understand, you know, sort of the, the, the nature of these kinds of relationships and how delicate the balance can be. And the story that I always remember is there was a tribe in um, it was way Northern Pl Plains tribe. And I can't, maybe it was the Blackfeet. I can't remember who it was, but um, they, you I'll say, so the bison here have been pretty much eradicated um, and they're considered a property of um, the, the federal government. But there was a, a tribe wanted to have a, a traditional Buffalo hunt, which they could apply for a permit to do that. And they were given a permit, but the permit came with some caveats. And so the scientists said, well, all right, you can have your hunt, but we want you to only take the old bulls because they don't, aren't really needed for anything. So you're not gonna take the females, and you, no, no calves, just the old bulls. And the traditional elders came back and said, that's not how we did things. We actually have very specific rules about which animals we can take in which season. And we wanna follow our traditional rules to do this Buffalo hunt, and it's not just old bulls. We need to take this many of this many creatures. And the government came back and said, no, you can't do that. If, if you're gonna do this, you can only take the old bulls. So they did it. I was like, well, it's the only way we're gonna get our Buffalo hunt. So they went and they did that. They took only the old bulls. I don't know, they were allowed to take 10 or however many they were allowed to take. And guess what happened? <laughs> guess who was right? Um, so winter came and the entire herd starved. Why? Because the old bulls did have a, a role to play which was, they're so huge. I don't know if you've ever seen these creatures, they're absolutely massive, those buffalo bulls. Um, when the ice and the snowpack, which can be like 12 feet deep, when that happened in the dead of winter, the females and the young were too small, they couldn't get through the ice. 
the only animals that could actually get through to the dried grass below were those enormous snowplow bulls. And they didn't have enough because they'd been slaughtered. So the whole herd starved. It's like, wow. so who are you gonna listen to? Like they knew because they had lived there for how many thousands of years and had observed and they had developed these protocols, these traditions that they tried to hold to. And of course the government told them they couldn't, but they knew what they were talking about. So there was a reason, there's a reason that the herd is that exactly that size with exactly that many bulls and exactly that many cows and exactly that many young. It's like everybody plays a role, right? We so have to, so much, so much arrogance about it, don't we? I mean, yeah. I remember a wonderful story. I don't know if it was tied into the other one that, that you were talking about, Ben, but where they reintroduced wolves into a Yellowstone. A, yeah, yeah. There we go. Is yeah, that yeah. what you wanted to talk about? I yeah, think. yeah. It even changed the course of a river, right? Completely. Yeah, everything changed. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, Yellowstone is one of our huge national parks here, and it's an amazing place. Um, but there are no wolves here. All the wolves, you know, were killed a hundred years ago, and it is very hard to get people to live. In, in harmony with wolves in the United States. I'm not really sure why they don't want to eat us and they even barely touch livestock, honestly. But, you know, everybody goes insane about it. So, I mean, I'm all wolf, so I don't, <laughs> team wolf. Um, but anyway, so there was this huge, this happened, it took decades to reintroduce these wolves. And they finally, finally, finally got everybody talked around, we're gonna reintroduce the wolves. So they did, they put in a small pack of wolves and immediately everything changed. What had been happening was of course, the deer and the elk had completely overrun the place because there were no predators. So they had been destroying all the rivers. Why? Because A, the water is easy. And also that's of course where the really young, juicy, um, like new growth comes all the time because there's so much water. So it's like, you know, really delicious, succulent, easy to eat little plants, which of course, you know, why move? Why leave the river? It's all right there. But they had destroyed the riverbanks. I mean, it was just mud sliding into the river at that point. So the just wrecked the river. Um, and of course there were no trees growing up to replace the old ones because all of the deer and the elk had eaten the little saplings, which are so yummy. Um, why would they move? There's no reason to, this is where the living is good. So it's kind of like a, you know, a human with a little TV control. Why would I move? If I can have junk food delivered to my door. I'm not going anywhere. So that's what they were doing was just eating junk food and like watching river TV. So in came the wolves and what do you know, they moved. And within six months, everything was transformed. And within two, three years, it was an amazing place because all the undergrowth, undergrowth came back, all the trees came back, the river, the water was running clear again. But of course, what this means is all the habitat is re restored. So there's like dozens of birds that hadn't been seen for years that now had a place to live again, that you know were, were ecologically evolved to live in those riparian zones. And now they had their habitat back. So all these birds came home. Um, and I'm sure a bunch of mammals as well, certainly amphibians, fish, whatever, but the birds are, you know, there's a lot of birders out there and it immediately was noticed, oh, wow, we've got birds again. And so now the elk and the deer behave the way they're supposed to, tightly bunched, quickly moving, and they called it an ecology of fear. And, you know, again, it's not necessarily fun to live in, in, in fear, but fear is an element of these animals' lives and it, it needs to be there to keep them behaving well. They're not going to do it on their own. And again, this is how you see that we evolved as a community with everybody playing a role. Without the predators, the ruminants just and the browsers just don't behave the way that they should. And it ends very destructively for all of us. So for the vegans out there who still don't get this, it's, there are no ruminants without predators and there are no predators without ruminants. And in the end, the soil eats us all. And we all need either the grass or the trees, You know, depending where we live, we've got to have something. So Absolutely. that's who makes the soil. Yeah, Leah, that's brilliant. You know, I'd just like to switch uh, tracks a little bit here because I, one thing that struck me when I was listening to, uh, to to one of your podcasts today was the the devastation that also all of these ridiculous ideas about agriculture and whatever have created in the human body and and, and um, especially in in the vegans and what we're seeing. You know, I, I live in a sort of vegetarian community here, and and some of the kids, you know, have had some pretty wild issues and you know you yeah. see sort of teeth rotting in the young ones and one thing that you mentioned was particularly heartbreaking which was i think it was something about a, some some vegan uh, sort of cult in israel or, or, or whatever where where some of the the children weighed less at one year old than they did when they were born born i know yeah. amazing and and you know we're seeing this incredible malnutrition 
uh, um, among the vegans. And also something very important, I think that you mentioned in that one too, was the, the quality of the, of the breast milk that the mother is giving right. to the child. And what I was, uh, we, we, we've, we've um, uh, met, I met actually at one of our gigs, uh, this wonderful lady called Nikita Stark, and she's been on our, our, ch our channel. And I've also spoken to, uh, she invited me on a course that she was giving, she's a doula. And she was inviting, uh, uh, she invited me on a course that she was doing for midwives. And so, will you come and speak on diet? And I thought, oh my God, here we go. <laughs> and so, I had children. But you know what? These are the people who need to hear it most. Exactly, exactly. Anyone who's going to have a baby, like they've you know, got to understand this. Yeah, and their mouths were wide open, the, the, some, yeah. some of, the, some of the, the, the midwives. But they, then they were sort of saying, wow, this makes sense. She was saying, you've really created a stir there because people need to be told how to feed their babies. I mean, I, I, I put something up, I had a friend of mine put something, which, which laws would you like repealed in the new world that isn't the new world order? And I said, can I add one, that it would be illegal to feed kids veganism? If you want to do it to yourself, it's your own business. But so to, talk to us about this and the things that you've seen in children and, and how important it is to give kids and mothers the proper nutrition. Yeah, so often there's this idea that, you know, breast milk is perfect and it, you should just breastfeed and everything will be fine. And it's not true. The nutritional status of the mother determines the nutritional status of the milk. And if she is a vegetarian or a vegan or nutritionally deprived for whatever reason, that breast milk is going to be lacking. And right now in the United States, they have been pushing this high carb, low fat diet for so long that the average woman's breast milk doesn't really contain enough fatty acids for the proper development of the infant human brain. So that's permanent, right? Like <laughs> you get one chance to build that brain. I mean, we're born premature because we'd never exit otherwise. We would not get out. So our heads have to be way smaller than they're gonna be. And that's a lot of people laugh and they call like the first three months of a baby's life, um, the fourth stage of pregnancy, because mostly they just sleep and eat. And that's all brain development. That's, you know, you've got to get that brain bigger now. And it's, this is your moment. Um, but it's terrifying to me that this whole next generation of kids is just starting off with, you know, way on the back foot here. And God only knows if they can catch up. I don't, you know, those developmental windows, windows they close. Like you, you just, you're not going to be able to build it in adulthood if you didn't get it when you were a baby. And that to me is terrifying. The B12 issue is absolutely true. If the mother does not have enough B12 and you're not getting any if you're a vegan, um, there are children who are brain damaged from this permanently. You can read this in the, in the medical journals because the mothers were vegan. Uh, vitamin D is another one. All of the, the things you would imagine are lacking you know, from that, that vegan diet right into the baby. Um, and then a lot of them go on to just feed their children things like apple juice. Oh, like that's gonna help. It's just pure sugar. And they really think that that's enough. You know, They've been told by somebody in their little world that, uh, oh no, we're naturally, you know, we're, we're frugivores. We should just eat fruit. That's the perfect food. So if you give your child juice, that's, we just need sugar. Um, and nothing could be further from the truth. And these children end up dead. They end up permanently damaged. Um, they end up taken by social services sometimes because even after they're, they're like in the hospital having seizures, um, some of the parents still won't give it up. They won't give up this ideology. And I have to say that I was very chilled <laughs> after I was out of vegan world and then doing research on this. It scared me because I never had children, but if I had had children, it would have been during my vegan years. And um, I don't know if I would have been that bad. Like when I saw the actual damage to my children, would I have stopped? Would that have been enough to kick me out of it? Like snap me out and think I, I need better information? Or would I, have kept, would I have been one of those people who just kept going? Would I be sitting here now crying because my children were brain damaged and I had done that because I wouldn't stop with this ridiculous ideology? I don't well, know. I mean, I was, I was that fanatic that it could have been me and it scares me. They don't see it, do they? They have. I, I remember seeing this this heartbreaking video with this tiny little kid who sort of had rickets, almost it looked, in, in the legs, and these little glasses yeah. singing a vegan song that the parents had told them, and they filmed it on YouTube. And I thought, right, I'm I'm going to put uh, my kids up because I have a son of 32 who was brought up vegetarian. He had some some issues from it, definitely, and they're my kids now who are pretty much fully carnivore one of the youngest one six he really is you know and uh, i so i put them up i had them eating meat and, and and chatting on youtube and i titled it um carnival kids dying of malnutrition and <laughs> loads of vegans reposted it and it was coming up on twitter and everything and then suddenly it was disappearing as they realized what it was about because <laughs> because i'd just done the clickbait title but 
it, I, I think it's yeah. So a really important one there that, uh, that 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 we should not be doing that because it's not it's not our business to do that to the kids. But how do we do it? It's still out there, isn't it? Plant based this, plant based that, and wow. Well, I had one, Phil. I had one telling me that the other day that the only way that humans evolved such big brains was down to high starch diet. And I thought, you are insane. I mean, yes, we have abnormally big brains, but the reason that anthropologists think that happened is because we figured out, or primitive ancestors figured out to smash into bones and smash into oh. skull cavities, right? And get all the lovely fats and, and amino acids that are in there, maybe, but mainly the fats that we needed to build our brains. And this guy's saying, no, it's because, it's because you know, we had all this starch. And I'm thinking, it really got me thinking that I couldn't think of a large mammal that gets the majority of its energy from starch. Or, I mean, can you guys think of one? Because because I don't. Well, there's, there's like mention? there's the cellulose eaters. So you got like elephants, but that's not starch. That's cellulose. Cellulose and it's bacteria that breaks it down. Yeah, I, it's making the high fat, high protein for them. I know. Like they don't even know what's going on. Um, start now. Well, there's gorillas. Just... These are hindgut digesters. They've got enormous long large intestines, colons, and stuff like that. Well, ben, Ben, they, they, they always say, don't they? Well, you should eat like a gorilla. Gorillas are big and strong. And I always say to the vegans, well, I'll tell you what, try eating 50 pounds of dry vegetation a day and your own poo. Don't forget your own poo because you'll be needing a bit of coprophagy to get any B12 at all. See how well you get on. And then you try feeding a gorilla a steak every day, right? They're not going to eat it and they wouldn't do well on it. So why exactly are we like it? Why am I living proof that I haven't eaten anything but meat for seven years? I'm still alive. There is no logic anymore. I was literally having this argument with somebody today online about the gorilla. It's like, look at a gorilla. What do you see? A huge barrel with little tiny arms and legs. Do we look like that? No. Why? Because we don't have that digestive system. It's totally different. Look at the difference between us. Just look, look physically look at a gorilla. We don't look well, like that. To, to be fair, yes, a lot of people do look like that these days, but not for the same <laughs> reason. <laughs> Back to the vegan thing, though, the vegan kids, just for two more things I wanted to add about that. The only children in um, wealthy countries, they get rickets. There's only two kinds of children you ever see rickets. Um, uh, children who are in vegan diets and very dark skinned children who live in very northern climates. And this study was actually done in, in Boston, which, of course, is very I used to live there. It's very cold and very northern part of the United States. And indeed, they would see rickets in children there in these vegan children. Um, and in fact, almost 50 percent of them showed some signs of rickets in the winter. Uh, and it's only vegans. Those are the only kids who ever get this. You know, we're not living in Dickens, London here. Like <laughs> we, this shouldn't be happening. And we know what causes it. There's, there's no mystery. And they're not getting any vitamin D, people. And it just no, breaks yeah. my heart. Are you sure it's not just a detox? Oh, yeah. If you do it better, it'll all be fine. <laughs> I actually, this was actually scary. I did once in a hotel. I once saw a grown-up man who clearly had had rickets when he was a kid. Um, and there was a, another conference was happening there. And there, I have no idea what their conference was, but it was a whole bunch of people from China. Um, and I couldn't understand a word. Obviously, I don't speak Mandarin or any of their languages. And I, I couldn't even read their signs. I'm like, this is fascinating. Who are these people? But there was a guy in the elevator. I saw him twice and his legs were just, and I was like, and he was walking, but I was like, that has got to hurt. And that's my entire life. The only person I've ever seen that has had that. And I was like, yeah, well, he's from China. I'm sure he grew up half starved. I mean, it was, it's just, it's horrifying. Like poor guy, you know, and people are doing this on purpose to their kids. Thinking we were, they're doing we were, the right thing. I was walking along once it, 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 when I was young. I can't remember what, how old. And, and there was a friend of mine was with me and we saw somebody like that in the street. And he just looked at me and he said, looks but looks like it's been lonely in the saddle since the horse died oh god that's terrible i know dreadful but it did amuse me yeah i don't know i mean his hip joints must be an absolute mess from everything was just completely at the wrong angle but wow i mean it was just really brought that home like we just don't see this um and then the other thing is that um all the all the tests that have ever been done on their cognitive development vegan children are behind like by orders of magnitude to their peers so every single kind of intelligence that they do with these kids um they're all just and you can talk to anybody who's a teacher i mean they they write to me all the time like oh god i've got a vegan kid in my class the kid is so lethargic can't stay awake can't concentrate is clearly depressed 
I don't know what to do. And I'm like, I don't know what you can do. Like, you're not allowed to call social services on them, but the kid is clearly starving. Well, what they do, what they do in response to that quite often is to introduce meatless Mondays at schools. Yeah, right. <laughs> Those people are winning. They're doing it in schools all over New York, San Francisco. Like, we've got to fight back, people. It is horrifying. They can't win. They just can't win on this one. There's too much at stake. Absolutely. So, Lier, we've taken up a bunch of your time. It's been absolutely brilliant. And last question, really, unless Ben's got one. Where are we going with this? Is there hope? There is hope because really the only way to repair the planet is to repair the planet. So if you care about the planet, agriculture is not any kind of future. That is the, that's where the damage began. That's how we're destroying the planet. And that's what we need to stop doing. So we need to let life come back. We need to let the grasses come home. We need to let the forest come back. We need to let the wetlands come back. Um, life knows how to do this. We don't even need to do much beyond just stop destroying. It will come back. We can help it a little bit, but it knows what it's doing. Like We don't know how to make a forest. Trees know how to make a forest. We don't know how to make a grassland, but the grasses know how to do that. The mycorrhiza know, they know who to call in next. They know who's needed where. And then if we just let the ruminants come back, it, it'll, it'll be fine. And if you're concerned about global warming, it's the only way we're gonna sequester that carbon. The grasses and the ruminants can still do this. Like Alan Savory loves to say, um, we're not out of time, but we're running out of time. So we've got to get on this. And this is why I have to keep speaking about this is because the people who care the most about this issue do not understand the nature of the problem. The solutions are so easy and they're right there. But as long as they keep telling people to eat wheat and soy, we're never going to get there. They don't understand where the damage began and what we need to do to stop it. But then, then we can all go truly vegan and eat the most vegan thing on the menu, which has always been grass-fed beef and lamb. Grass-fed beef, that's it. Yep, that's it. The only animal smart enough to make its own food and dumb enough to eat it, aren't we? You're I love out. that line. That's just right. beautiful. I yeah. do have one more question. I'm listening, but my dad, my dog is crazy to get inside. Come in, uh, Carter. Come in. Another carnivore. <laughs> she wanted to hear what we were talking about. She's like, "Eat the meat. That's all I got for you." Like, <laughs> one of one of the common objections that you may hear is, "Well, we need agriculture because because agriculture can produce." X many calories per acre, and you can't do that with grazing animals. Um, how can we feed the planet if we go carnivore? Um, another how one can we feed eight billion people if we are like, only eating mainly meat and fish and stuff like that? So, what's your I'll, take? I've got two takes on that. One is we don't actually know how many people we could feed if um, we actually were doing grass-fed ruminants appropriately. There's in fact a lot more food than we're aware of because of, you know, a lot of areas that we think of as being overgrazed are in fact undergrazed, but because they're not being, you know, bunched and moved, um, it looks like these areas are degraded. They are degraded. I mean, shouldn't lie, but they are absolutely degraded, but it's not because, you know, of the ruminants presence. It's because the ruminants behavior, that's, that's the issue. And a lot of the places that are this degraded, you know, when they do an Allen Savory type rejuvenation project, um, they can increase stocking rates by three times, four times as many animals. Um, and get glorious results of recovery. So we don't actually know, but honestly, they're asking the wrong question. Why do we have 8 billion people on this planet? We are so clearly on overshoot. Um, at the beginning of the industrial age, so you know, year 1800, there were 1 billion people on this planet. We were already in overshoot because most of them were here because of agriculture, which is drawdown. Okay, but there were only that many people because we were already destroying the planet. We had already, you know, <laughs> wiped our way through multiple continents at that point, and we're living on monocrops, then there's no future in this. You know, the soil's drying down, the water's drying down, it's mass extinction, all of that, it's already happening. And so we're already, you know, on this path toward, you know, the cliff at that point. And then what did we do? We added a bunch of fossil fuel into it. And since then, we've gone from 1 billion to 8 billion. There's no conceivable way anybody can think that this is a plan with the future. Um, what we're eating is oil. That's what we've been eating since 1950. And this is not a substance that reproduces. Once it's gone, it's gone. So we are on the downside of you know that curve, and yeah, it's just a slope downward. And I don't there's there's no future here. So why are there eight billion people, and why are we attempting to somehow sustain that as a number? It, I mean, it literally can't be done. Yeah, where is um, it that we are supposed to be feeding eight billion? 
we, we, we just, it, I don't, it's just the wrong question. We shouldn't have this many people. And that's, that's really the issue. This is what agriculture does is that it, it overshoots the human population because there's this temporary surplus. So agricultural societies always do this to their land. Um, there's this temporary, you know, growth in humans because nobody else is living on that land but humans. Um, and then of course it collapses. And so most civil, well, there's been 34 civilizations. All of them have collapsed to date and they last between 800 and 2000 years. Like, and as David Montgomery says, it's the exact length of time until the topsoil collapses. And then that's the end of the civilization. So we're at number 34 here and this one's not gonna end any other way. So really our choices are to acknowledge that fact and do something about it like reasonable people who have giant brains or we can keep letting it spin out and it will end in the usual, you know, famine and warfare and genocide. And, you know, I mean, this is where it always ends is the last proteins in the cooking pots are human. It's cannibalism. I mean, it's people are gonna starve and that's, it's horrible. Famine is not fun to live through. And that's, that's where we're headed. I don't, again, like, you know, there I am, Jennifer Lawrence, you were all gonna die. But that is historically where there's not gonna end any other way. Like, this is just reality, people, I'm not, I don't say this with any glee. It's just, this is what's staring us in the face. So we could do something about this, but we can only do something about it if we face the nature of the problem. So yes, we need a contraction in the human population. So either nature's gonna do that for us and it will be ugly, or we could do it ourselves and it would actually be not a problem at all. But yeah, it means we need to face the reality of the, the kind of political institutions that we have on the planet and the problem with them. Um, you know, we'll throw a little bit more in here the number one thing that actually helps drop the population in every place this has been studied, and it really has been studied quite thoroughly, but the number one thing you can do to drop the population growth is teach a girl to read, mm -hmm. which is to say when women and girls have that much more power over their lives, they actively choose to have fewer children. Yeah. And all things being equal, in fact, what most couples want is two children. So there's always a few people who want big families and that's great. And then there's always people like me who don't want any, and that's fine too. But the average is basically two, which is interesting that if everybody has what they need, it seems that <laughs> our human impulse is replacement levels. The only reason that you get more is because of things like patriarchy and, you know, racism and poverty and, you know, whatever, like all the reasons that people are poor around the globe, which is not a natural state. It's created by political institutions that, you know, put a very few people on top and everybody else at the bottom and they're used like resources that get to be extracted. And here we are. So if we put an end to all of that and give everybody basic things that we all need, um, yeah, the population stabilizes pretty quickly to two, two children each. Um, half the children that are born every single year are either unplanned or unwanted. So all we have to do is give women complete reproductive sovereignty. And honestly, the problem cures itself. Mm -hmm. Simple. I mean, it's not going to be easy because we're up against, oh, the Roman Catholic Church and <laughs> various other fundamentalist religions. But, you know, it's not hard. It just means we need to give women and girls full human rights. So that's that's the thing we need to do. But this is this is it. Like it was never people versus planet. It was always people plus planet. It's just yeah. full human rights fixes it. It fixes the problem. Absolutely. Well, I reckon we're completely on the same side there. And we, we we must get you along to our one of our carnival conferences. We had we had one in 2019 and it in was Spain? Just was that the one in Spain? Yeah, it was it was just beautiful. And uh, you know, we had to shut them down, obviously. You know, we had lots yeah, of plans for them in the but States. But that's over. We're all mask free here. I don't know about you guys, but we're we're pretty yeah. much done with Let's here. hope so. Just as long as nobody has to get any sort of arm raping you know, to get on a plane these days. We'll, we'll, when it's all completely settled down, we'll be back on that. And I'm really looking forward to it because Ben actually joined us after that and missed that one. And he was, we were planning the next one. He didn't get along to that one, but we, we must, we must do that again soon. And well, yeah, have it in the UK. Don't have, I don't want to go to Spain, but I want to go to, I, my sister lives in England. So I want to go UK, UK, do it in the UK. People are shouting for us to do one in the UK. So yeah. That's we, my vote. So. Excellent. We must get you along to one of those. But anyway, Thank you so much for your time. Really no, you're fascinating. very welcome. I'm sure I talked way too fast and way too much, but no, you didn't. No, it's it's, it's really so much information. I just got to get it in there. So no, it's brilliant. You know, there's there's nothing worse than somebody that talks like that. And no, <laughs> spot on. Thank I'm you, Leah. Caffeinated. <laughs> Thank you. No, and I I want to say I appreciate you both so much. And um, I couldn't do my work if you all weren't doing your work. 
Like it's, it's a symbiotic relationship. So exactly. if there weren't people doing podcasts, I would have no voice at all. So I'm always really appreciative that people, that's a lot of work what you're doing. So I, I very much appreciate it. Yeah, likewise. You're more than welcome. Thank you for what you're doing too. Right, Leah, thank you so much. Call.